So I'm going to share this screen and I am apologize for not being in presentation mode. Um, but that seems to be the only way for me to do this. Um, but on the plus side, it will allow me to take some notes as we're going. Um, can you all see my screen? Yes. Great. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and dive in. Um, uh, sorry, one more second here. Let me make sure I can see the chat, if anybody has chats. OK, so if anybody chats, I can see it now. Um, OK, so agenda for today's meeting. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the current status of the project, what's gone on in the past month, then talk a little bit about the ongoing work that I don't think is going to need any discussion. But please let me know if we do need to discuss uh, something on this ongoing work. Um, then a few things that over the past month uh, probably needs discussion now that we have um, people in a room together. Um, and then talk a little bit about the plan for the next release of Gym 5 and if there's anything else um, from the floor to talk about that. Before I dive in, um, I want to try to make this a uh, something we do at every Gym 5 meeting, um, but I want to briefly remind everybody of the code of conduct. Um, so this is on, this is committed in the Gym 5 repo, um, and it, I'll let you read um, a couple of the first sentences from the code of conduct here. Uh, one thing I want to remind everybody about is uh, code reviewing. We strongly encourage everyone to uh, be a code reviewer to contribute in this way. Um, it's a huge help to the project uh, for you to review other people's code and even review your own code, to be honest. Um, and really importantly, you don't have to be an expert on Gem 5 or have used Gem 5 for 20 years to um, be a helpful code reviewer. Some quick uh, thoughts on code review. Um, you know, number one, be kind. You know, people have contributed this code, so let's be nice and uh, try to help them. Um, try to give specific and actionable comments. So things like, you should change this if statement to be a negative instead of um, what it currently is. Um, and don't leave comments like, I don't really like the way that you're doing this here. Um, give specific and actionable things for people to uh, address. Um, don't let perfection be the enemy of progress. If, if there's a change that's good, but not perfect, well, let's probably merge it unless there's something that is really wrong uh, with that change. And this is kind of the last line is the way that I approach code reviews. I kind of ask myself, does the code do what the commit message says? Is this code improving Gem5 for someone? It doesn't have to improve Gem5 for everyone, but does it improve it for somebody? Does it meet the Gem5 style guide? And then, you know, on my side personally, a lot of the things that I think about is, does this code increase the maintenance burden? And if the answer to these questions are yes, 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 no, um, then I think it's a good change that you get in. Um, if anybody has questions about code review or wants to you know, kind of learn more about it, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, this is also something that we'll probably try to do some training on um, in the next year or so. OK, so real quick highlights from the last month. Um, so things are about the same as in September. Um, we have a little slightly more um, uh, traffic on the Gym5 repository, um, but there's about the same number of issues opened, about the same number of pull requests. I'll say we did get a little bit behind in reviewing. Um, Bobby, who is one of our um, most prolific reviewers, was on vacation for the past couple of weeks. And so we got a little bit behind. Um, but we're hoping to clear that backlog over the next couple of weeks. So one unfortunate thing that happened um, is that our continuous integration and testing infrastructure has been very flaky over the last two weeks. Um, let me give you a little bit of background so you can understand why, although I don't think there's really much of a solution here. Um, so what we do, we use GitHub Actions so whenever you push something, a GitHub action is triggered on GitHub, but then we execute these actions with self-hosted runners. So most of our tests take a lot longer than the maximum amount of time that they can run on GitHub. And it would also cost us a lot of money to run these on GitHub. So instead we run these tests on infrastructure that's at UC Davis and at Wisconsin. 
The infrastructure at Wisconsin, as a side note, was uh, donated by Google. Thank you very much, Google. Um, we have a bunch of different uh, tests that run. So we have the continuous integration tests, with which take a few hours, daily tests, which right now are taking more than 24 hours, compiler tests, which run once a week, and these take about a day, weekly tests, which also run once a week, these take a couple of days, um, and then the weekly GPU tests, which I don't actually know the current status of. Um, I don't know if somebody... They, are, they, they don't take too long to run. Uh, we're just keeping them separate for, for for like now because they required some more engineering effort. Okay, I'm working uh, on scaling for a reason that I think is quite easily fixable. So they are they may not seem like, like I think they're almost going to be part of the weekly tests. Yeah, it looks like Matt Sinclair isn't here right now. Otherwise, I'd ask him um, what the current status is here. Uh, any of the people at Wisconsin... I apologize. I'm not great at trying to figure out uh, names to uh, GitHub. If anybody's here from Wisconsin who knows the status of the weekly tests, or Matt Peremba, if you know, please. Um, I think the, uh, I'll just say what I understand the situation to be is um, all the code that we have is on GitHub as PRs, and some of them, uh, the all 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 the details and what's blocking the ones that are, haven't been merged yet, or is all on the all all in the individual PRs. I don't think there's any big thing blocking. We just need to sit down and go through these uh, one by one. Okay. Um, okay. So we have all these different uh, runs, and so as you can kind of tell, like. We have quite a bit of, and each of these, um, so this is the latency, but a lot of them are running in parallel. So it takes a lot of compute resources to run all these tests. Um, so to dive a little bit more into the details as to what's going on, so we're running them locally, but of course this could be a uh, security problem. So we run them locally inside virtual machines. Spinning up these virtual machines, we're using Vagrant to try to manage them. And Vagrant is not very user-friendly. We don't have a lot of experience with Vagrant. And by we, I mean Bobby, <laughs> who's been uh, driving all this. Um, and uh, so we're kind of struggling here. Um, and the last thing I'll note is that there's a trade-off between the cost to run these. So if we ran them on GitHub, it'd be very expensive. Or if we ran them in AWS or um, Google Cloud, very, very expensive to run these, what we're talking about, probably thousands of dollars a month. So there's a trade-off between that cost. And then when we're running them locally here at Davis or at Wisconsin, there's a trade-off between the amount of control that we have over the systems and the amount of responsibility that we have for the system. So, and these are really at odds. So we don't have root access at Wisconsin, um, which is, not easy, makes it really hard for us to solve problems when it goes wrong. But then while we do have root access here at Davis, it means we have responsibility for keeping the machines up. And that's also difficult to do. So we haven't found a good trade-off between these things. Um, I don't think there's any obvious solutions or simple solutions, but if anybody has ideas or is a vagrant expert or something, um, we would love to have some help in managing these things. I'll also take anyone who really likes like the like uh, apparently you're supposed to do it via Kubernetes, but I have no idea how to do Kubernetes on the scale that we're doing things or really at all. Um, just when, whenever you Google this question, GitHub's response is always just use Kubernetes, and I don't want to. So, <laughs> oh, Chris Button raised his hand. Um, there it is. Um, hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So two to three hours for the continuous integration test. Is that like the total amount of time to run all of the tests? Are there lots of little tests or that's like kind of the latent, that's like the latency of the longest test? That's the latency of the dependencies. So um, that's like beginning to end. And lots of those are broken up and run in parallel. It, 
it's probably six to eight out CPU hours. Yeah. Um, okay. And like those are run on every GitHub push? Like Yep. I mean, I think one one thing to maybe think critically about is how to have a smaller, shorter regression test, right? So um that's a <laughs> I, I I would almost be like we used to have this up to about six to seven hours when we're on Garrett. So I I I'm almost like, oh we now we can start adding some more tests now that we're back down to two or three. Um I know I like to I like the um I I do like having these having errors detected quickly on the PRs. And if they're not, if not detected there, they're detected on the daily tests, which that could be harder to diagnose what the problem is. Okay. Yeah. It's just I think a lot of software projects have shorter regression tests, right? That are that that spin more quickly, I guess. And that's yeah, I, I would say our big fault is we don't do unit testing very well right. at all. If we had better unit testing sort of frameworks and utilization, we could definitely do faster. But we just run a lot of very big Gem 5 jobs to prove that Gem 5 is working correctly. And that just even the compilation of Gem 5 is quite weighty. Right. And um, then you have to run jobs that could take like 20 minutes at least. Yeah. So this is maybe not, you know, not an easy solution, but maybe some thoughts here are, you know, so, so basically every test is recompiling like the gem five or no we no no it uh, it, no we 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 solved that problem okay. uh, we only ever compiled gem five once okay That's and then that idea. binary is copied to all other uh instances uh to run okay. the jobs all right anyways it just might be interesting to think about this might be one motivation like super long term not an easy fix but for more unit testing i guess because it it helps reduce the computational load of the the regressions which yeah, I, I really worked on this when I first joined the project, and basically the major problem is it's very hard to decouple Gem5 into like logical right. units you can test. Uh, uh, we are kind of wanting to fix that at some well, point. Another, another idea might be assembly testing, right? So smaller, much smaller assembly tests, um, So, but you know, maybe that doesn't give us the coverage you want. And I, I, much, I think, yeah. Yeah, th th thanks, Chris. Uh, another, another thing to Another reason why our tests take so long and we run so many is that we support a huge right. number of different kinds of systems, right? both simulated and host systems. So like, for instance, the compiler tests, we're compiling, like we officially support like 30 different compilers and every damn compiler has a different error on things. Well, maybe we should um, just support fewer compilers too, right? And just in terms of like the standard, you know, the you know, the we're supported are the ones that are essentially rigorously included in the CIs. This is maybe for a longer it, conversation, but one way yeah. maybe to help address this issue is to figure out how to take a smaller slice through this, which is the kind of the maintainable, the like officially supported, you know, kind of set of things. And my policy um, has always been that we will support the compilers that are. Uh, the minute I always think uh, we're a very Ubuntu focused project for some reason. So we support all the long term currently supported uh, Ubuntu ones. And then if and whatever is installed as the default GCC compiler on the oldest version is the last, the earliest version we support. And that's my arbitrary rule on what compilers we support. Uh, but I'm willing to drop some definitely. Okay. Mm. I guess, I, I guess, like, I think, I think Gem 5. CI is like a huge, huge deal. Very, very important. And, you know, it's it's the difference between, um, you know, a real legitimate open source software community and it can, it's a huge, a huge benefit. So definitely important to continue to think about how to make this easier to maintain and, and more effective, but I don't have any easy answers, but it's exciting to see this is happening, but I'm glad we're going to continue yeah. to try to think about how to make this even better. Strongly agree. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so some quick uh, notes on ongoing work. Um, so this is mostly just an FYI to everybody in the meeting. Um, there is a pull request to get classic prefetchers. So the pre pre prefetchers that are currently work with the classic caches, which is a huge range of prefetchers um, working in Ruby, uh, specifically the CHI protocol. Um, this is mostly ready to go. I think um, there's just one question that uh, Matt Sinclair asked that I wanted to look into. Um, but I think it's basically ready to go. Um, 
improvements to workloads and resources. So this is something that Harshal here at Davis is working on. Um, so the idea is to have on Gem5, on the Gem5 resources website to have full benchmark suites and workloads. Um, and this is taking a few updates and also making some tooling so it's easier for us here at Davis uh, to manage the database, which is living um, online. So these are in progress and should be done in the next week or two. Um, then kconfig, so this is changing Gem5's build system to no longer, well, to improve the options for different ways to build Gem5. Um, I'm not sure what the current status is. Uh, Roger Chang, who is online, um, I can promote you to a panelist. Can you say what the current status of this is? Or, um, yeah, feel free to use chat or unmute yourself and talk. Hi. Hey, we hey. can hear you. Yes, yes. And uh, the current, and uh, currently, our K config build system is is much of a dog. And uh, I have created a separate the uh, pull request for a daily test and the weekly test. So, is there anything blocking this being merged? I I think it isn't okay. I think they are working working well as it's bad. Uh, could yeah um I wasn't there some maybe I'm sorry I don't want to wasn't there some issue with this not working for some of the tests um or am I thinking something else? No. I think that was I, resolved. I, I, oh okay, over the past couple of weeks, Bobby. Okay, uh, just making sure. Sure, I'll I'll look into merging it. I'll put that on my list. Okay, okay, thanks. Cool, thanks. I know this has been a lot of work, Roger. Thank you for um, putting up with how slow this has been. Um, but it's a really big change. <laughs> and so I, I think it's, you know, kind of makes sense that it's going to take a while. Okay. Um, okay. And then the other thing that's ongoing is uh, improvements to the branch predictors and the front end, which we're going to talk more about um, later. Um, anybody else? Uh, have any ongoing work that they want to discuss or anything related to these um, changes? Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Sorry, Matt. Oh, yeah, no, I was just going to bring up, um, I don't know if you saw, but on the the patch that I posted about fixing the GPU, like L1 M MSHR TBE behavior, um, I have it now working on all night daily and uh, weekly you know, tests, but there's a design decision we have to make there. Um, I think it's patch 540. So yesterday I posted kind of, the four options that we have i don't we don't need to take up everybody else's time if you know the simplest thing is just to say that you and matt p you know we should take a look at uh you know what those options are and we can have a conversation but nonetheless the point i wanted to make is um there are options there i have tested the first two of those options in varying forms but there's not one, you know, they, they each have their own pros and cons, babe, maybe to, to put it simply. Um, okay, unfortunately, I am unprepared to discuss this. Don't worry about it then. Just put it on your, you know, never ending to-do list to, to, to take a look at the four options I've laid out there. And then, you know, you and Matt P and I can, can discuss. Okay. Um, could someone write that down for me? Thanks, Matt. Uh, 
next month, feel free to send me an email about something like that and I'll put it on the agenda so we can discuss it. Okay. Yeah, it's the, the part of this meeting is helping everybody be organized. And it's uh, right now we have things spread around in a lot of places. So organization is difficult. We do our best, but we definitely miss things. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, let's dive into some discussions. Matt, I'm glad you joined because this is the first discussion is something that um, we needed your input on. So there have been two different memory leaks. So let's see, Jacques, is Giacomo here? Yes, great. So Giacomo, you pointed out a memory leak in 514. It sounds like it's the same memory leak as 508 slash 518 but I can't really tell. Are these the same memory leak or not? Please discuss. So I only know about my pull requests. So I don't know, I don't have like uh, the pull requests here. So the problem was that atomic partial is um, uh, automatically, uh, as, as we were saying, in, you're saying in the slides, just populating the atomic log. And what happened was that this was like a change um, into what the atomic partial was doing without really um uh changing something in the interface if understood correctly so what happened is that uh while other protocols were uh manually clearing the log that what you're supposed to do now uh basically in the chai protocol we didn't do um we didn't do that and that's why basically the log was never cleared but as soon as we as soon as we actually added the manual clearing which is like a sort of temporary solution i guess or like it's a solution um, then everything starts working. Uh, I think another discussion is whether this is actually the right interface because as far as understood, we are not really actually, like we are using atomic partial, but we are actually not using the atomic log, but we are still generating these logs and manually clearing it without really using the data. So, but it's a separate discussion, I guess, like how we can actually make sure that these sort of new memory this sort of new allocation and the allocations are only done if they're really needed yeah yeah so i think there's a but require um a very similar fix but because the issue is in Ch the chai protocol and the issue is in the viper protocol and as Giacomo kind of just hinted at, we don't have a single place for you know, like everything like this to be handled. The fix is not, even though it is a similar fix, it cannot be done in one single place. So was that confirmation that this is the same problem? Uh, I don't understand enough about Giacomo's problem to say, but I believe it is a similar problem. The difference is that Chai doesn't use vectors and, and Viper does, but they both have the same problem that they are leaking the, the atomic information, yes. So this atomic partial and the atomic log, when was this added and who added it? Uh, was so it this, this was added by Bougie, I, I don't remember when. But just a comment there, I think there is a single solution. I've posted it a few times now, but just don't use the log unless necessary. So it should have an extra parameter whether or not to use the log, which should default to false. And then it should only be true in the Viper protocol. That, Are you that's sure my that proposed solution. I actually, I actually didn't see that. Let me just check the code of one sec. Maybe I'm wrong. Oh, sorry, what didn't you say? I, I missed part of that. Uh, the chance to actually select to not use the log, basically. Yes, it does not exist. I'm proposing adding that and making it ah, yeah, right. okay, okay, default to false. Would that solve the problem um, in CHI, uh, Giacomo? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, as I said, like the problem is technically solved from a functional point of view. We don't have the leak anymore. It's just that we are allocating and deallocating memory on the heap for no reason. And yes, that would solve that. 
Okay, it sounds like that's what we should do. Um, so, my Soria Noop, which is your GitHub name. I don't know what your real name is. Um, I've. I think it, it's. I think it's just a Noop. Okay. So a Noop. It would be great if you put your real name in. But otherwise, do you understand yeah. what this conversation was so you can update your change 518? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can do that. Um, I'm, I'm listening. Um, my name is Anoop, sorry. Uh, I was not able to figure out how to change my name. OK, you can right click on yourself and update your name if you want. I would also suggest updating your GitHub name as well. Got it, OK. It's always nice to see other people as humans instead of avatars. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, that was um, super helpful, y'all. Um, yeah, okay, moving on. Uh, discussion two, uh, failing tests. So right now the compiler tests and the weekly tests are failing. Um, I don't think we need to have a long discussion on this. Uh, so right now the compiler tests are failing because GCC 9 I guess has some kind of bug in it because it is all the object files are double the size of every other GCC version. We can't just drop this compiler because this is the default compiler for Ubuntu 2004, which I think we need to support. However, our compiler test is going to keep failing because we have 16 gigabytes for each VM. And I don't think we really want to increase that memory. Bobby, did I capture that correctly? Yeah, I'm more on the team camp that, you know what, if we're testing 8 and 10, uh, I mean, I know we do like to test every single version of GCC that we support, but given that this is just, I assume this is a compiler bug. Let uh, me phrase it another way. Yeah. It seems like if someone tries to use, tries to compile Gem 5 on Ubuntu 2004, it's not going to work. If and that's have about 30 gigabytes of memory, yeah, probably. Because <laughs> it seems to, for some reason, GCC 9 seems to make the object files about twice as big. And then the linking is about twice as big, and we run out of memory. And uh, I, it's not on GCC 8, it's not on GCC 10. And I Googled this several times and can't find anyone who has the same problem. I want to say it's a GCC 9 problem, not a like Gen 5 problem. Chris Batten uh, wants to talk, so I'll just start. Um, I think we bumped into this exact same thing. Yeah. Like, I had a new user that was, I said, just use GCC 9, and he kept being like, it's not working. And I'm like, it's upstream GCC. It should just work. And then we then we used GCC 8, and it started working. So maybe it's just GC we should not support GCC 9. and just. I'm tempt I was tempted just to solve this with having a disclaimer on our supported compilers page and saying, hey, don't use GCC 9. And eventually, what, how, how much longer is this? 2004 have a life one and a half years or something just tap it out tell them that if you're on 2004 you're you should upgrade to 10 or even downgrade to 8 i and if, it, and if this is a gem 5 problem i have no idea what it could be i don't really want to look into it sorry to be so uh kind of dismissive about it but i don't want to <laughs> I think it seems perfectly reasonable not to, uh, yeah. I think yeah, I'm gonna... I think I, I think I'm gonna probably go into that camp, uh, drop that test, and wherever we list our support compilers on the building page, just give a warning. I guess this is a known problem. We could throw a warning in scones too. Oh yeah, we can do that. That's such a good idea. Even better. Yeah. So just so you know. So I understand the problem. So just so you know, I just checked and we actually internally, mm -hmm. uh, we have like an internal CI and we actually compile Gem 5 with uh, um, GCC 9.3. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, yeah, it just depends on your machine. I think we are um, building on Red Hat and uh, I think it's going to be So I, I might, it, it works. You just have to have more than 16 gigabytes of memory. Ah, uh, yeah, right. It's like everything's double the size for some reason. I haven't looked into the object files to see what's been doubled, but that's essentially my feeling. 
Um, okay, I'm. Is anybody strongly against throwing a warning saying that GCC nine takes a crazy amount of memory and dropping this test? Cool. That sounds like consensus for that, Bobby. This, yeah, it's a cheap solution, but it's fine by me. Cool. cool. Um, and then the other test, so our weekly tests are also failing, but we think it's a pretty simple thing to fix. That said, weekly tests haven't really passed in a long time. So even if we fix this, it's not clear if that's going to make all the other weekly tests pass. Uh, that's not... There's, I think the only tests that are failing are the uh, X86 boot tests. I think the other ones have been passing. Okay. Well, that's good. It's not as bad as it looks. Uh, okay. Cool. Maybe we should make our badges have a percent. <laughs> yeah. So with the caveat, Bobby, that I don't totally, I have not been running the weekly tests with the YAML setup. I'm pretty sure Lulash is also broken on weekly, but I just, on the head of develop, but I just haven't had a chance to yeah I think dig, I dig into up, what's going on. I think that's a I think that's I think that's a really simple fix if I just find five minutes. I think we're just uh, we, I think we put the wrong path for a file that we reference. I think that's literally it, a given the error. So that's all. Okay, maybe you're getting a different error than me. That would be good to know. Uh, I okay yeah I I can maybe send you what I've got after this meeting, but it looked to me like it couldn't find the config.json file. And I think we just specified that as a path somewhere. So I, I suspected the path was incorrect. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm getting an error in like the actual GPU kernel. So I'm getting further than that, but I'm also running it like locally, not part of the YAML files. Okay, so that might be the bug I run into when I fix the YAML files then, okay. but. Since I've been dealing with this other bug, I have not had a chance to dig into it. Okay. Uh, that's good to know uh, that there might be more nasties ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, I, if you can get the other issues you brought up fixed first, then this is, this is quote unquote, only, you know, one application. And at least from when I ran the old deprecated, you know, test shell scripts last night to test the thing I referenced in 540 earlier, all the other GPU tests are passing in weekly. So on the head of develop. So in theory, it's just that one, just that one and whatever x86 boot tests that you're facing. Yeah, okay. the x86 boot tests, I think, are just failing because we're not compiling the right version of Gen 5 to run um, the various protocol various various ruby protocols we're testing so i think that's also quite an easy fix okay let's move on because we have 20 minutes and we have other things to discuss um uh, okay uh bargov i'm gonna kind of turn this over to you um because i'm not sure exactly what you want to discuss but happy to have yeah. <laughs> discussion Let, let's try to keep it to five minutes or so Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I want. Uh, would I be able to share screen? I uh, do have like few uh, slides to show, uh, or I can mail you immediately, like if you think. Sure. No. Uh, that's fine. I I'll, I'll try to take some notes. Okay. Uh, no, it says host disabled participant screen. Oh. Screen share. Um, Ivana, can you enable screen sharing for panelists? I'm not sure how. Give us one second. Let's see if we can figure it out. Okay. In, in the middle, I'll try to export it as PDF so that <laughs> I can mail it to you. Okay. I think I think I did it. Can you share it now? Okay. Sure. I, okay. Just give me a second. I, I close my file in the meanwhile. To <laughs> uh, okay. Yes, I, I got it. Yes, I, I have a number to share this thing. So yes, uh, there is there is been this issue where x86 is overly uh, conservative when uh, it is resolving dependencies, and this is specific to x86. I'm going to show a simple example to show why this is happening. Uh, one second, are you guys able to see my screen? I'm just talking. Yes, about yes, yes. Okay. you can see it. Great. You are seeing the right screen, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yeah, in the x86 register mapping, the way uh, if you see 
we have uh, rx ax ah and al all these are actually basically the same register so same 64 bits but uh, instruction can use either uh, component like either rx ax ah and al but in gem5 all these are mapped to same physical register when you're renaming it so what happens like that uh, that's a big problem because i'm going to show some two cases uh, two cases to show why it would limit ilp and how gem Gem5 is right in the sense, in a, in a way that the correctness is not broken. It is correct, the execution wise. But how it got there is what limits ILP. So let's look at like uh, two cases here. Um, in this in this case, we have RAX, where uh, one instruction is modifying RAX in, uh, in I, and J is only modifying EAX. So in this case, uh, the way uh, Gem5 handles is that like before modifying EAX, uh, since you're writing to the same 64-bit portion of the, uh, like the, your physical register is same. So before uh, updating EX component of RAX, so you need to make sure that RAX is ready. So you have the full register and then you uh, basically update EX. So yeah, because of this uh, case, now we are, uh, in this case, it's kind of okay-ish, but what if you have other case? In, in, in which case we have EX and we modify RAX. In this case, we don't need to add the dependency at all. So uh, to handle the first correctness of the first case, uh, that overly restricts uh, cases like two, and this is has this has become uh, like um, big bottleneck. I've looked at workloads where uh, like are base full, but because of these dependencies, some instructions which could have been executed but not executing, but it limits uh, ILP to a large extent. And a potential, I'm, I'm going to show some numbers why uh, why this is an issue in terms of like uh, performance. But I'm going to propose solution and before moving on to do some uh, results. So the solution is to treat uh, all these registers like as atomic registers. So when you write to uh, RAX, you basically treat it as four uh, eight bit registers, four sixteen bit registers. And e EAX would be like lower half of uh, two atomic registers and so on. But the issue here is that like this would require change to the renamer uh, because renamer would expect probably one is to one. For every uh, register that you have, uh, I don't really know how much it would impact. But what I understand is that like uh, it's going to cause some issues in the um, to implement this. It's not straightforward, but this is uh, a reasonable solution to fix. But I'm open to any more suggestions uh, for this uh, problem. And this this problem is specific to x86 only. This is, this does not appear in ARM, and uh, because in ARM um, it's like it's always fixed. I might be wrong, but I, what I've seen at least in, in cases where uh, it didn't appear. So here are some uh, workloads where uh, I took traces from Gem5 and ran it on ChampSim, and which means that uh, I preserve the dependencies that is coming out of uh, Gem5. And I also was trying to see what is the impact of wrong path. And it shows that there's a, a wide range of uh, variation in the performance. So it's like, you can see uh, variation going from minus 30 percentage to almost like close to 20 percentage on the positive side. But if you do the same thing for x86 workloads, uh, the gap is low. That's because ILP is very much limited and the dependencies are carried forward to champs and master when I do this. So the problem is big. It, I mean, it does not completely show, but there is a side effect of it. It's not like I didn't measure it uh, to that level, but when I looked at the cases, that's what it looked like. Uh, ILP is limited uh, in x86 workloads, but not in R. Uh, any so, questions? Like, I just want to see. I, I guess the, the question mm -hmm. is, like let's let's assume we implement this solution. How is it going mm -hmm. to affect ARM and Risk Five, right? Because the O3 model needs to be generic. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean if we give a bunch uh, like instead of saying one is to one mapping, uh, if we have one is to n mapping, in that case, if you when we are renaming registers, we give vector vector of register that you are depending on instead of for each register. So it's like in case of Risk Five and ARM, it would not, I believe, should not change. So, because, uh, sorry. So, yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, I think like um, a good design for that would make sure that, uh, you know, um, all the ISAs which are using it will be impacted. But mm -hmm. what I was thinking is we actually have like a sort of similar problem, even in ARM, though it's different. It's okay. basically okay. with the uh, ZA register in SME, where mm -hmm. basically we have like this big accumulator register and uh, we will actually... We would like to be able to basically split that register into atomic registers because uh, that's basically like a matri uh, matrix register and you want to be able to do like renaming of different slices 
And at the moment, the interlocking is as such that even if one instruction is touching one slice of the matrix, then you act and you have an, uh, another instruction which is touching a different slice, those instructions are actually seen as dependent. And that, of course, affects ILP with SME instructions. Mm -hmm. So actually, we would welcome a solution um, that would allow us to do something which I believe is very similar, if you understand what I mean. Yes, I, I think uh, uh, that's a good, good point. I didn't know, I didn't look into uh, ARM side, but uh, this is a very reasonable concern, like, which means that it happens in other places too. So it sounds like um, it would be a good idea to do uh, um, do uh, example implementation here, like make a proposed implementation and let's mm -hmm. check the code and see how it yeah. works. Generally, I, I would caution against having a bunch of like if x86 statements in the O3 CPU. Um, but otherwise, I think that this, you know, it, it sounds reasonable. Yes, I, and the problem, I think uh, the main reason for the discussion is that like if anyone is interested in <laughs> fixing this uh, code, like we have a solution, but <laughs> yes, yeah, no proposal yeah. or like yes, you're unlikely to find someone who's going to jump in and just do this. <laughs> um, but we we would greatly appreciate uh, the contribution. Uh, I can do it, but uh, I mean, not immediately though. That's a, uh, it's a, it's a caution that if someone is looking at this part loads, like you be aware of the fact that there's ILP is limited, but that's the main uh, reason why we have this discussion. Like this is show, if you're seeing some other oddities, then it's because of this probably. And yeah, and in a couple of months, hopefully when I get time, I can uh, push for the solution. Uh, yeah. So if you want to write up a little bit and kind of add mm -hmm. it to the discussion that you have, um, mm -hmm. That would be great. Another thing we can do is post that on the Gym 5 website so people can find it easily. Sure. Yeah, that's a good solution. Oh, there's something in chat. Right. Yeah. The CC yes. flags are also a problem. Yes. For the same reason. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. Okay. okay cool. I'll stop sharing. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> Great, and really good job doing that quickly as well. That was a complex thing to talk about quickly and you did a really good job. Thanks, Susie. Okay. Um, so the last point of discussion, um, again, unfortunately, we're gonna do this relatively quickly. Yeah. And Sandberg isn't here, although he's the one that wanted to discuss this. Uh, sorry, there's a hand raised. Yeah, I just unmuted him. You should. Uh, I uh, just to add an, another option for a solution to the um, interlocking problem that you were talking about a moment ago. Uh, would another option to be to have each register having a dependency mask associated with it? Um, so for most registers, that would just have all the bits set. Um, and then that would get carried down the pipeline and uh, you kind of add together the masks of two instructions to find out whether they um, interfere with each other. Yeah, I have a that question a first. So if I want to overnight this, what's the right form to get? <laughs> hey, Matt, you're muted. You're unmuted. Someone mute Matt. Just did. Thanks. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> uh, sorry, just as an option that would be a bit less intrusive, perhaps. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's an interesting question, which one would be the better approach. So uh, it works as long as the scheduling decision is not made uh, based like before that, like if, I think in gem pipeline, uh, when we decode and then as soon as we decode, we assign this uh, in a rename stage, but either way. Yeah, yeah. As long as, uh, yeah, if we, if we take care of these cases before scheduling, I believe any solution will work. And I, I, I appreciate uh, uh, yeah, maybe, any maybe solution. Sure, sure, yeah. Yes. As, as Giacomo said, uh, we've got an interest in this as well, so it'd be good to kind of open up a discussion. Yeah, I, I think as more and more we do vector extensions as well, this will be more and more important for all ISIS because everyone's vector extensions have uh, potentially overlapping uh, register rights. 
and reads. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so let's uh, switch gears a little bit to uh, front-end improvements. Um, so a lot of work has been done over the past month. Thank you very much, David um, and Andreas for pushing this through. Um, one high level thing from my side is we need a place to kind of discuss and track the progress of this. Um, so I would greatly appreciate it, David, since you're kind of driving this forward, if you could create an issue and link to all these different PRs and kind of talk about what the next steps are that needs to be done. I see. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Sounds good. I would do this. Yeah. So we've you, you've done a lot of great improvements this month. Thank you so much, David. Um, and uh, I think what's currently in progress is actually implemented the de decoupling uh, decoupled front end. Um, and then Andreas wanted to have this discussion about requiring uh, BTB hits to the tech branches, which he was discussing in 493. Um, I'll let people read the tiny text here. Apologize for how small it is. Um, but basically it's a change that might cause a small IPC decrease because currently Gem 5 is cheating. Um, my personal opinion is let's implement it correctly, even if it does come at a slight performance decrease right now if it's gonna enable a much bigger performance increase soon. But um, if others have opinions, now is a good time. And David, if you wanna update, like give us any other updates of the current status, um, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a question how to, how, how it, I mean, Usually, if you in a high performance front end, you only know if there is a branch if you have a BTB hit, and currently you pre-decode, so you know which which instructions are branches. So you only query the branch predictor for branches, and um, yeah, that is okay if the front end is not decoupled, so you can't do the cheating. But uh, for um, the decoupled front end. Yeah, it's, it's, you need to, yeah, it's not working. And also it's a bit cheating because if there is, for example, if the, for a return, if there, if it's not in the BTB, you still push, uh, you still pop the uh, return address tag and this is not possible because in a, in reality. So that is basically. I think that makes sense. And I'm all for making it more realistic. I, I don't know if um, others on the call have a strong opinion one way or the other here. Making it more realistic is a good thing. Okay. That sounds like consensus to me, David. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah. Any other updates? Uh, like, uh, what, what are the other major things that need to be done before we can uh, declare Gen Five has a decoupled front end? Um, so yes, and the, the last two weeks, yeah, I was at Micro. That's why um, I, I'm a bit behind, <laughs> but I should have time now to to get um, to get the remaining things into Gen Five. I will. I hope that I can that it's done until Christmas. So that is my plan because yeah, it, everything takes a bit longer. So should be done, but yeah. Okay. I think so, it's realistically to get it done until Christmas. Yeah. So it would definitely be helpful to have an issue page, um, so we have one place to go to look to see what needs to be done. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. Okay. Any other thoughts on this? Um, Bhagav, do you have any uh, anything you want to add or any updates on your side? Because I know you're working on something similar here. Yes, I mean uh, I don't have I haven't made any progress since last time, but I picked some issues on my end. Uh, as in, like I I work on older version of Gem Five, so I found like a way to make uh, found some issues on the code that I submitted. It, it only works with x86, but on with uh, ARM. 
I'll be pushing those patches soon to make sure that it also works with ARM. But yeah, it'll be good to have uh, more workloads. As I suggested, like uh, if you have uh, a way to test both x86 as well as ARM and other workloads, but to <laughs> see the impact. That That's good uh, yeah. feedback. Um, people on the Davis side, could you please write that down? Um, more workloads to test this. Spec is hard for us to distribute, um, but let us think about this. That, that that's a good piece of feedback. I know, yeah, like I think <laughs> Richard has been running these things for David. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the benchmark to try uh, FT would be Cassandra. I had a uh, hard time, like uh, fixing Cassandra gave me a lot of insights in like where things could go wrong and eventually getting performance like like GCC for X uh, for spec. Cassandra for FT would be a good uh, fit to try it out, like to know what's the impact. And yeah, I think to call it a decoupled front end, one thing I noticed typically was that like decoupling is one thing and attaching a prefetcher to the decoupled uh, FTQ is is what would actually give you performance gains. Yeah. So not yeah. just decoupling. So that's the very, uh, that's a key thing to uh, show the impact. Yeah, that's from, true. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, and you're, you're right. right. Basically, the decoupling makes it a bit uh, the performance of even worse because you add another stage, so also more latency. But um, when you add the prefetch, then it you get the performance. Yes, it's true. Right, right. Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, so let's. Uh, um, move the conversation into this new issue that's gonna be created. Okay, finally, in the last three minutes, um, we're not gonna have a lot of time to discuss, um, but I wanna talk, we wanna create a staging branch for the next version of Gym 5. If we're gonna have another release in 2023, we're gonna to have to create the staging branch by December 1st so we can do the release by mid-December so we don't run into the holidays. Um, so I have a couple of things here under must-haves like to have and won't have. Um, I wasn't sure where to put these, but it kind of sounds like kconfig is, can be in the must-haves that we can get that done this week. And it kind of sounds like improved front end is gonna be down and would like to have, but maybe towards the bottom of that um, to be able to get it done by December 1st seems relatively unlikely, especially with the ISCA, ASPOS and ISPAS deadlines coming up, um, which I totally understand. So. Given that we don't have a lot of time for discussion, I'm going to just let you all know um, that Bobby is going to create an issue, which is going to list all the PRs that need to be merged before we can create the staging branch and can track what needs to be done in these cases of must have and would like to have. So if you have anything that you want to get into Gem 5 before the next release, make comments on that issue that Bobby is going to create today. Um, and then we can uh, make sure that those get in. Okay, great. Um, that's all that I have. Um, anybody want to, in the last 60 seconds, discuss anything? Okay, great. As always, thank you so much um, for being here. If you have any other feedback, on this meeting or on Gym 5, feel free to reach out. Um, and we will talk again on the second Thursday next month, which will be the 14th. Um, so we'll talk again on the 14th. We will send out an agenda earlier next month. Um, apologize for the delay. Um, we're learning how to do this. The 14th is probably going to align pretty much when we're going to make the uh, the uh, version 23.1. So it could be somewhat celebratory. Sounds great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, I will see you all sometime soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.